So the two of you that don't know me, my name is Stan Plum. I'm the curator here, uh, as Therese alluded. This room used to be the full length of the, uh, the museum. It was an auditorium. It was called Library Hall from the time it started way up and probably until at least into the 60s or 70s, uh, people would uh, have programs up here. And it was uh, kind of a center point of town. But this building is the, I like to call it the transcendental dream of Ward Lamson. Ward Lamson is one of the founders of our fair community. He came from, uh, from uh, uh, Massachusetts. He was a transcendentalist by nature. Uh, his father, Silas, uh, was a, an inventor and became quite wealthy uh, through a, uh, a device that made uh, scything uh, crops a lot easier. And he was also quite eccentric. Uh, they became well acquainted to the transcendental movement uh, of Ralph Waldo em Emerson and uh, Henry David Thoreau. Uh, Ward Lamson uh, took Thoreau at heart, and he went to live in the woods. He came west uh, and moved to Burlington, Iowa, and worked in the land department out on the prairies in uh, the 1830s. In, uh, he had a, a, his, brought his wife, uh, they had a child. Uh, the wife died within a couple years of the birth of the first child. Uh, Lamson was offered a job in the land office here in Fairfield and moved here and became, ran the land office and became the head speculator. Now Lamson was a, an educated person who found himself with a daughter and on the prairies of Iowa with no education system, no way of enlightening young minds. So in 1853, he came up with the idea of a subscription library. His family was growing. He had a total of nine children altogether. Uh, I believe six to, or seven were daughters. And uh, they were all as precocious as he was odd. He was, uh, uh, became a very wealthy man. As a land, uh, somebody asked me one time, what brought people to Fairfield? And I said, greed. <laughs> uh, he, uh, uh, Ward was a, uh, a land speculator and he made money off of people. In his old age, he said, when I look back at the things I did to make money, I'm sure people thought I was a hog and they were right. And, <laughs> but he, he had the dream. He had the dream of, of raising a family, teaching the children, getting them introduced to nature. So the girls and the, the sons, uh, were turned loose into the, uh, the, the prairies and woods of Fairfield. Uh, they lived in the corner of Madison and Maine in a house that's now gone. Uh, their neighbors around there were an, an interesting group of people, a lot of the founders of the community. And children of the Lamson children's age all got together and they developed a club called the Agassiz Club. Now, the Agassiz Club was a club devoted to the study of nature. So as Ward was developing a library, a subscription library in 1853, later these children began developing a club that collected things from nature. Ward helped them out. He uh, shot an egret and uh, had it uh, mounted, and it's still out here on our display, so that they could see what the birds looked like up close. They didn't have good binoculars back there. They wanted to go birding. They couldn't really see things up close. So a, uh, Ward helped them with that. Uh, another doctor here in town, uh, Schaefer, uh, was also a, a taxidermist, a musician, a jack of all trades. Well, he began... Um, shooting birds and other animals and uh, doing his, practicing his taxidermy on them. And he became a very, very good taxidermist. And the children would learn from his taxidermy. Well, down the road, uh, a few houses from the, uh, the Lampsons was uh, uh, Wilson, James Falconer Wilson, who became a congressman and then a senator. Uh, 
as congressman and senator, he traveled back and forth across the country. He'd taken a shine to these Agassiz kids and uh, began bringing things back for them. Uh, arrowheads from Ohio, axe head from Tennessee, uh, fossils, weird things that he would come across, he would bring back for the kids. And the kids developed a little tiny museum in an old brick house. Well, in 1882, uh, the Library Association had decided, one moment, that we needed a permanent structure for the library. The library had been in several buildings around the square and was moved frequently. And the Agassiz kids, their house was to be torn, their little museum was to be torn down. They needed space for the museum. They needed space for books. Uh, so uh, Wilson, uh, Lampson, and the rest of the library board got together and decided in 1882 to build a, the building that we have here. They commissioned a, uh, a firm to design it, and then they had a beautiful design, but no money to build it with. Uh, Wilson, uh, between the time that he was a congressman and the time that he was a senator, uh, worked for the railroad department, the, the transportation department of the government uh, and with the railroads. And he became acquainted with people like Andrew Carnegie, who provided all the steel for the railroads. And um, through this acquaintance, he uh, became aware that Carnegie had built several libraries around the Pittsburgh area and was dedicated, as Lampson was, to the education of uh, the people. So he was, uh, Carnegie was approached for a loan to, uh, come on in, come on in, we have seats scattered around here, um, to, uh, to, to help fund uh, the building. It came out to be about $40,000. Andrew Carnegie uh, gave the money to build the building. So the building began construction in uh, 1892, 10 years after the, the original design was drawn. More room. Thanks. Um, so the uh, the building was built. Uh, 1893, the building was still under construction towards the final phases of it. And something horrible happened. There was the biggest economic crash in 10 years, and certainly the biggest one until the, uh, the Great Depression. Things started shutting down badly. Uh, the uh, library was finished. It took a while after it was finished to uh, actually uh, get the books in and find the space for everything. But in 1893, in uh, uh, November, we opened our doors. Uh, the uh, collection for the museum consisted of uh, an interesting group of objects, not only the Agassiz children's uh, objects, but Wilson had become a senator and made friends with people in the uh, Smithsonian. The Smithsonian had an interesting problem that most museums, including ours, eventually have, is that you had too many things. But uh, in, 17, in 18, excuse me, 1875, they had a different problem. They didn't have anything. The Smithsonian burned to the ground and they lost almost everything. But America opened its attics and began donating things to the Smithsonian. By 1885, the Smithsonian was back to its old problem is that it had too many things. It didn't have any space for them. Uh, not only did people give them things, the uh, Bureau of Ethnology had fanned out across the West and began collecting uh, objects of Indians because it was known at the time within a generation all the Indians would be gone. So they needed to put all their objects in a museum. So the Bureau of Ethnology went out and started making these collections. So within very few short years, they were back. 
they had no room for anything. So they started a program, possibly with Wilson's help, certainly with Wilson's, Wilson used it, in which museums in the districts of congressmen or the states of senators could request objects from the Smithsonian that there were duplicates of. And the Smithsonian would package them up, put them on a train, and ship them wherever they had to go. Wilson was uh, a very powerful person at the time, a very, uh, he, he was able to talk people into just about anything. And he got the Smithsonian to send us an incredible collection of the things that they had. And I've got a few of them up here, but uh, that was, the collection started rolling in long before the building was built. And again, they had trouble storing everything here. When the building was built, the uh, Smithsonian collection was one of the first, uh, the, 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 the founding collections of the museum, along with the birds and animal uh, taxidermy of Dr. Schaefer. And then uh, some other folks around the community uh, had things that they had done. There was a fellow over in Ottumwa uh, who, get this on, who uh, was an archeologist of sorts who uh, traveled down to Mexico and made some incredible finds and developed a, a wonderful collection of things like obsidian spear points. And this one is a piece of obsidian that uh, blades were struck off of. And this is not the, this is the least of the things he brought back. One of the things that he found was a very large stone, about six foot long and probably four or five foot high, that was engraved with a, a calendar or something. It's difficult to tell. It was an idol stone in Mexico. So the Mexican government wouldn't let him uh, bring that back, but they did let him make a paper mache cast of it. And he brought the cast back and made two plaster of Paris copies of the stone. One he sent to the Smithsonian, like I said, the Smithsonian always got stuff, and the other one came to us. And it's down the basement, almost out of sight completely. If you go down the elevator, if you go down to floor one, there's a kind of a hallway that this uh, large plaster cast of uh, this stone that was brought back for the museum uh, is still here. The Smithsonian sent objects like this, which they wanted to show how Native Americans used similar technology in different parts of the country. So they sent us boxes of, these are called celts, celts from different part of the country. We got one there. This one is, I believe, is from uh, Tennessee. Here's one from Indiana. And the idea was to teach people the differences in how people did things. Um, aside from that collection, there was one other collection that we got in, uh, and that was from uh, a man named Byers, who was a local politician who became ambassador to Switzerland. And he sent back a lot of things, including an incredible collection of Swiss lace, which Mark and I were just talking about. We're not sure where it is. Over the years, things seem to have vanished. But we have, we have a lot of hidden crevices. I expect I'll, I'll probably find it eventually. But uh, they, uh, at the time, there was a, uh, a village that was coming out of a lake. The lake was drying up. And the village they called Robenhausen was a late Bronze Age, early Iron Age village that had been flooded and uh, it had been burned, flooded, and then now was rising out. And the common thing in the 1880s was to go up to Robenhausen and uh, go play archaeologist and collect things. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Byers certainly did that. Ambassador Byers did that and brought us back a very large collection of things, including a early Iron Age hand axe, which is, uh, oh boy, that's probably oh, 15, 1600 years old. But to look at it, the way that it was hafted, everything looks like just a, practically like a modern one. There's some obvious differences, but. Uh. And then there was other adventurers uh, that the, uh, well, the Smithsonian, of course, had people bringing things in from all over the world. The Indian collection uh, that Wilson was able to get was 
came from the Stevenson expeditions to uh, New Mexico. And they went to the villages of Zuni and Hopi and some of the outlying villages, again, to collect artifacts because they knew that in a generation, these people were going to be gone. Well, uh, Debbie and I just got back from vacation where we visited some of these people. <laughs> They're still among us. But uh, these are the collections. We have acquired perhaps one of the largest collections of Zuni pottery outside of New Mexico or the Smithsonian. So we've, we've done incredible things. And in 1880, up to the Yukon, there was an expedition. And from that expedition, 1888, we got a pair of moccasins and a pair of snowshoes from the Smithsonian. Uh, these were used, I believe, in the uh, rescue of a ship that was uh, caught up in the ice. Uh, that, that these, I believe, were probably were just a uh, maybe from Alaska. I would say probably. Uh, oh, I don't know. Deer of some sort. Uh, uh, maybe the their. Um, oh yeah, we had, we and also another thing that was brought back is a uh, a rain parka that I I can't bring down. I can't show yet because it's it's in really dangerous conditions, about ready to fall apart, but it's made out of walrus intestines. Oh. <laughs> it looks like a really fine parka. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it smells badly, but uh, the, uh, uh, Dr. Schaefer, so we had the, the Smithsonian collections, we had the Byers collections, uh, we had uh, the, uh, the, uh, the name slips my mind from Atamwa, uh, the archaeologist, Evans, the Evans collection, thank you, Captain S.B. Evans. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Schaefer's birds and animals, such as this. He did a wonderful job. Uh, Dr. Schaefer uh, was a world-known taxidermist. Today, when you walk into a museum and you see a bunch of taxidermy, you're, some people are kind of horrified by it. it it's, it's a little bit macabre, but here in Fairfield, it becomes part of the community. It was Lampson believed in teaching the children, in particular his children, but the whole children of the community. And he used the, the library and the museum as the tool to enrich Fairfield. Um, the, uh, the library, well, the library as Ward Lampson envisioned it was a subscription library. And in 1893, this building was built completed, opened up to great acclaim, and also to uh, financial disaster. Uh, in the next three years, the place was broke. It was about to be shuttered. But uh, they uh, had an election, they had a, a, a vote to see if it could be brought into uh, the possession of the city. Uh, the uh, Library Association was willing to give it up if the city was willing to take it. There was a vote. And in 1880, 1896, sorry, I'm, I'm an archeologist. I don't know dates. I'm not a historian. Yeah. But in 18, there's an election uh, to see whether the library should be brought in. And it was a very unusual election for the time because it was the first time that women in the community were allowed to vote. And, uh, that, and again, I, I, I have to take this all back to Lampson and his daughters. These were very strong-headed women, and I suspect that they had more to do with the fact that women were allowed to vote in the election of the library than anything else. Uh, Ward Lampson, uh, his, his, his dream still lives. We're here. Uh, we're learning from it. Uh, his, the things that he, uh, he taught his children are being taught today. Uh, his children took his philosophy and expanded it out. Uh, his daughter Emma married uh, the next door neighbor, uh, Mr. Elmer Howard. Well, uh, Howard was a railroad man and uh, worked for the CB&Q uh, Railroad. And the CB&Q needed some land from Fairfield, or they had some land, they had to do a land swap uh, for, their, for the train station down there. And Howard wrote into the land swap 
that as long as that land is used for a park, the city can have it. And until the, such date, when they decide they don't want it as a park anymore, it goes back to the CB&Q. Well, I thought that was a rather interesting way of doing it. In 1960s, uh, the city decided that that park would make a really good parking lot. And uh, they had planned to turn it into a parking lot until somebody goes, uh, yeah, you can't do that unless, you know. So they, uh, we, we still have a beautiful park. And again, this is the Ward Lampson influence. His daughter, Carrie, uh, was bequeathed uh, on, on Ward's death a uh, 40 acres in the southeast corner of Fairfield, which we know as Lampson Woods. Now, Lampson Woods has a similar thing. As soon as it's, as long as it's not, uh, administered according to Carrie Lampson's wishes, it will go back to the Lampson family. Wow. And uh, in the 1970s, that, uh, that issue came up. They wanted to cut down a bunch of trees by Lampson Park uh, for a road, road widening, and the Lampson family brought it to the attention that if you're not going to follow Carrie Lampson's uh, strictures in this, you're going to have to give it back to us. So the trees were saved. Uh, <laughs> so there's, there is a... Uh, the, the, this idea of transcendentalism, nature being out there that everybody should enjoy it, you should learn from nature, that is what brought us this museum. Uh, Lampson's Children, the Agassiz Association. The Agassiz Association, this group of kids, that's another interesting group because they are basically the founders of the museum in their own little way. Uh, Twelve kids had one microscope and they liked looking in the microscope at little tiny things. But you had to stand up and move over and look in the microscope, and the next person come over and look in the microscope. Well, one of the kids had the idea, he got his, uh, a round top table, put a <laughs> set of ball bearings on it, nice green felt top to it, and it would turn it around. You could just spin it around. Interestingly enough, we still have that table here in the museum. Uh, along with things like that, going back to the original uh, 1893, uh, we also have records. Oh, please, 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 please. Wrong way. Yeah, grocery bag. Uh, Mark found a grocery bag that was about to be thrown away one day back when we first started uh, redoing the, uh, we first started redoing the, uh, the museum, and uh, within that grocery bag, he found, remarkably, a full set of records ah, from the Smithsonian saying exactly what they gave us, wow. which is phenomenal. And I, when I saw that, I got really excited, really excited, until I looked a little bit further, and I found a full set of records of everything that the Evans Collection site gave us from Mexico. And I looked a little bit further, and in here, oh, let's see, is the original records of the Agassiz Club. Uh, this is 1870, uh, I'm not sure the exact date on it here. But they're all in here. It's all know, uh, all knowable. So the 1870s. So we we have it all. We have the heart and soul of education in Fairfield right here in this museum. And I I really appreciate seeing a crowd like this show up to to because it, it tells me that Fairfield still cares, and that's the uh, the thing that we're looking for here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I, uh, any questions anybody has, I'll, I'll give a shout, try at it. And if not, I'm sure Mark will probably know. Yes, sir. Uh, 